Good? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our final conference on the reparations project. Sorry for a little couple of hiccups there. We had problems getting the Zoom uh, set up. Um, hopefully those in line can hear us and see us now um, and also see um, the program presentations that will start soon. Um, today's conference uh, is a sort of a tying up of a bow of a, a project which has been five years in the making. Um, and um, what today we want to do is to share some of our findings um, with regards to um, what has happened during the project um, and also bring along some of our investigators um, and collaborators uh, to talk about some of the findings they've had on reparations. Um, and in many ways, we're in an, a better position than we were when we started this project with regards to reparations. And um, we are seeing uh, states engage more and more comprehensively um, in trying to live reparations, but there's still uh, complex problems that we'll talk through today. Um, before we really get kicked off, I just want to say um, a couple of thanks to uh, Susan Declan um, Richard, who've helped set up stuff in the background to get things started, um, and also Daniela, um, who's been organizing things as well. Um, we will be uh, going through the sessions probably um, a couple of minutes behind now, maybe five minutes behind. It's quite relaxed today, despite me being <laughs> amped up. <laughs> um, but we are going to um, talk a lot about the findings, and we encourage discussion and questions from the floor as well as online. Um, and this session will be recorded. Um, so that's to be aware of. Um, maybe to start with the project itself. We set out writing this about six years ago. Um, Kieran, uh, Cheryl, um, and even Rachel Killian were involved in the, the, the initial drafting of this project. Um, it started off as a small one country, two country case analysis. It grew into six, and we also then had also colleagues in South Sudan do some work. Um, it's been quite a large project, um, and um, we have managed to deliver on all the promises that we made, <laughs> despite how big they were. Um, hopefully the outputs themselves, you'll see, um, they've been done brilliantly by Colin Slack, our designer. Um, some are available at, at the desk, and I've also included the guidelines in your packs. Um, online, it's now available on the website, are both our handbooks, um, as well as the guidelines. Uh, and you'll see we've done a lot of sort of background work in terms of uh, the data itself. So we've interviewed over 400 people in about 250 interviews. And we have published about 12 country reports and also thematic reports. And these are some of them appearing on screen now. We've also got a large database which collects practice and um, case law, legislation, even application forms um, and doing reparations. And that's available on our website. It now has over 100 countries. Um, so if you're interested in doing more research on reparations, that's a free accessible resource. Um, but today we're really focusing on two um, of our main um, outputs that we promised to do. Um, the two handbooks and our guidelines, which we'll talk about later this afternoon. Where does this all come from? Um, well, the reparations project itself, um, I was lucky enough over a decade ago to work with Kieran on a project here in Northern Ireland um, in relation to um, amnesties and prosecutions and talking about how we apply research to policy agendas. And one of the things was, which was often missing and still is neglected in the debates on the end of the past year is this issue of reparations. And so as part of our interviews, so these 400 people we spoke to, um, the first question was, what does reparations mean to you? And we wanted to come at it in a quite an open way to people. We didn't want to sort of say, well, this is what international law says, or this is what your country does. We wanted people to sort of think for themselves what that word connotes. Obviously, there's this issue with translations, um, et cetera. But we wanted people to sort of think outside the box and um, to sort of to frame our conversation with them. And what we got is um, a whole range of views on what reparations means to them that doesn't necessarily track to what human rights law would say or even what their domestic reparations programs are doing. Um, and we talk about this, this in our project about the vernacularization of reparations, that reparations has its own sort of language or um, dialect in the sense that certain things are amplified more than others. There's really good website, a really good uh, video on our website by Ram Bidari, um, who's one you know leading victims campaigner in Nepal, where he talks about reparations in Nepal being framed as Puri Puran, where it's about a supplicant asking for a favor, and so it really plays in this, this sort of uh, cast overtones, which um, frames sort of the root causes, one of the root causes of the conflict there, uh, and so something we've, we've talked about a lot in the project is how reparations can. Um, 
in, as, as, a, as a, what they're supposed to do in international law is to remedy wrongdoing and remedy violations um, and supports societies moving forward and to reconcile. But often what happens is they're also used for political purposes, to exclude people, um, to um, deny redress because of somebody's background, um, or to continue sort of discourse about how the conflict was fought. In Northern Ireland, it's very difficult to talk about reparations. Some political parties will not talk to us about reparations, they'll frame it in different language because they don't want certain actors being seen as responsible. Um, and so it's difficult to talk about these issues when people are doing, using different language all the time. Um, so these are just a range of issues that we'll talk about throughout the day and we'll maybe come back to when in the guidelines section. So we clicker. Working. So where we were starting with this project was what was the problem? The problem was we were looking at it was that reparations, we've got all these international norms, we've got all these case law and human rights courts and the International Criminal Court and a lot of domestic practice. You know, we were able to show that over a hundred countries have done something in regards to reparations. But what we also um, is finding in the literature is that a lot of countries aren't actually following through on delivering redress. And so previous research has sort of pointed out there's quite large gaps between 16 to 25 percent of countries that are emerging from conflict or transitional um, violence um, deliver reparations. So most countries don't, in other words. Even in our six case studies, there's massive problems in delivering redress. Um, we'll talk about Colombia, where we've got over 9 million victims. Nearly a fifth of the population is registered as a victim for reparations. And it struggles to deliver redress to all those victims. Um, even in Northern Ireland, um, when we started this project, we couldn't really talk about our reparations process. Now we've got the Injured Victim Disablement Scheme. Um, and we'll have Mark and Paul talking about it today which has been a success because you've got a, a, a program that's been set up by a victim's movement that's pushed and put political pressure and also legal pressure to get this secured. Um, but in other countries we're seeing, like in Uganda, South Sudan, even in Nepal, not um, all victims have got redress. Um, so it remains an ongoing problem. And so to address this problem, our outputs have aimed at how we can support both civil society, armed groups, and even states to deliver on redress. In Colombia, one of civil society actors said this, but you know, it's, it's fine doing reparations, but in situations of um, ongoing violence, of uh, fragile security situation, in Colombia, there's you know, nearly 10,000 victims being added per month to their victim registry. So somebody said this quote, you know, how do we sort of turn off reparations? At what point should we stop doing reparations and start living as a normal society? I think in Northern Ireland as well, it's something we need to be thinking about as well. How do we deal with the past and move on without allowing compete um, oblivion and um, amnesties um, which don't properly deal with the past. Um, so some of our findings, um, which I'll just talk about in very um, loose terms. Um, what is happening with, uh, we found with reparations and where, where reparations is delivered. And we're talking about compensation law, we're talking about land restitution, we're talking about rehabilitation um, for victims who are injured, etc. Where this comes about is not because states feel charitable or because states feel it's a legal obligation. It's a bottom-up exercise where victims put a lot of pressure over years, very likely decades and even generations, to get the, to get the change that they want to see, both culturally within a society, but also politically, that they can get mobilized support. We see this in Northern Ireland where the Injured Victims Campaign was quite successful in doing the long-term um, campaign, you know, nearly 20 years, um, in order to get the legislation brought forward in 2020. And even then, they had to go to the courts in order to get it um, activated. Um, so the victim struggle is an important part, both to getting reparations secured, but something which we've also looked at in Colombia, particularly with Afro-Colombian communities, is that the notion they talk about of self-repair, that the struggle for reparations, the struggle for dealing with the past more broadly, is about a way for them to come together and build strength after what's happened, to come together with other people who can share their experience. Um, and the fight against those um, who try to deny um, and try to remain, remain the culture of impunity around the violence of the past. Something which, you know, Pablo de Grief and others will talk about is that reparations help improve trust within society, help to improve uh, reconciliation. We didn't find this so much. We did some, uh, some really good interviews up in Derry, London Derry, Stroke City, whatever you want to call it, um, where people there talked about who received, you know, sizable amounts of compensation from the state after state violence did not trust the state. 
so reparations didn't change your opinion. The same in Guatemala, and this is a picture up in the highlands of Guatemala, and where victims there are still struggling 30 years on from the genocide to receive any sort of recognition from the state. And those who have received compensation know that because they had to fight for so long for it, and because the state tried to block or deny them at every turn, um, it, it didn't help them move on, and it didn't help their uh, community feel welcome within society still. So it didn't, un it didn't tackle the root causes of violence. That's what I'm going to say on the findings. There's plenty of things I could talk about for hours, and my students are well bored of me talking about reparations. Today, I want to sort of open it up more broadly to um, our collaborators and the organizations we have worked with, such as the Victims Commission, such as ITTJ, DIOM, and Redress. And we're going to talk about some of the key themes, you know, victims and victimhood, and a more general uh, session on reparations and all the different aspects that came up uh, during our project, and then looking at how organizations support this after lunch, and then turned our guidelines in our final session. It is quite, I want to make it informal, hopefully, <laughs> um, where we can have a conversation. Uh, I've told our speakers to stick to 10 minutes. Some have asked for 12, not looking at anybody in particular. Um, so we'll have, um, hopefully, time for questions. There'll be good breaks in between um, for coffee and for lunch. For those online, if you post up your questions, I'll be monitoring the chat and the Q&A on the Zoom. Um, and we'll be able to um, ask some of the questions to the speakers. Now, I'm going to take some coffee and hand over to Ian uh, Jeffers, the Victims Commissioner. So thank you for coming, and I look forward to your engagement. If I'd known you could have asked for 10 minutes or 12 minutes, I would have asked for 10 minutes or 12 minutes. Uh, look, said speak for half an hour, so I'll try and condense it a little bit for you. Uh, look, thank you for the opportunity, and thank you to your colleagues for the opportunity to provide some remarks at the conference this morning. And uh, it's, it's a privilege to be here really marking the conclusion of what's a comprehensive piece of work, so thank you for that. There are three broad areas I think I'd like to talk to this morning. Uh, briefly, I'll touch on some of the achievements delivered under the current strategy for victims and survivors in Northern Ireland. Then I'd like to spend some time considering the challenges and opportunities that I think we all have in common. So achievements, challenges and opportunities. Before considering some of the achievements, it's perhaps worth me giving a quick introduction on how I got here. Uh, why am I the Victims Commissioner? This is the first public appointment I have held that comes under such intense public scrutiny. I've held senior positions in national charity in a US stock market listed company, two sectors that come under constant public analysis and scrutiny, but neither compares to the role of the Victims Commissioner in Northern Ireland. It is without doubt a positive that many people have an opinion on the role and watch it closely. What I have found, though, strange is how quickly people are prepared to use victims' issues as a point-scoring exercise for political gain. It certainly wasn't that that drew me to this role. Anyone that has worked with me in the past, whether it's in the third sector or in the uh, private sector, knows that my key driver is about making a positive difference for people. It doesn't matter whether it's providing a cheaper internet service in my telecom days or securing employment for a young person. It's about making a difference for somebody. And that's what I want to do as commissioner. Now, time will tell if I can achieve it. But I say to you what I've said to everyone else that I've met since coming into this post a few months ago, I expect and welcome you to hold me to account if you see there's things that we should be doing more of or doing things differently. What did excite me about this role was in one breath, people told me I was mad. And then in the next breath, they said, yeah, but you might be able to make a difference. So that's simply why I'm here today. So again, thanks for the opportunity to say a few words this morning. Reflecting upon developments and future plans at an individual and societal level from the perspective of victims and survivors in the context of reparations after conflict is both timely and very helpful. It provides an opportunity to review the roles and responsibilities of governments, of strategic partners, of other stakeholders, including civil society, to effectively support those most affected by conflict legacy, while implementing a range of measures and reforms to address legacy issues and hopefully prevent future conflict. Now, the Commission has, without doubt, suffered 
as a result of the pandemic and, as you all know, the absence of a commissioner for over two years. And that can only have had a negative impact on victims and survivors. However, one of my first observations is the strength and skills of the many groups that support victims and survivors. And it's perhaps the greatest achievement under the current strategy. And if victims and survivors can be connected and engaged with groups, there is support there. There is constant limitation on resources and funding's tight, meaning these resources must be allocated to achieve the best possible outcomes for victims and survivors. And undoubtedly, there are a number of successes under these funded schemes. There's been acknowledgement and improvement in the health and well-being of many victims and survivors as a result of accessing a range of community-based funded services across Northern Ireland and elsewhere. Indeed, one of my observations as Commissioner was the clear strength and the range of skills within the different organisations supporting victims and their families on a daily basis. The securing of resources has supported the Victims and Survivors Service to administer funding to a host of services from psychological therapies to social support to education and training and financial support. And we've also then seen the appointment of Peace 4 funded health and wellbeing case workers and advocacy support workers based locally and in the South and in GB. In recent weeks though, I've met a number of the smaller funded groups that cannot always offer a full range of services. And some of their users, service users, seem reluctant to avail of services if they're available from another provider. Further work is undoubtedly required here to ensure equal access to services from all victims and survivors, regardless of their location or indeed their background. Now, another significant development has to be that of the Regional Trauma Network, RTN. The RTN is, as you know, a new specialist psychological trauma service for victims and survivors of the Troubles, and it will come into operation in the months ahead. The new trauma focused service will involve a close collaborative partnership between the health service and several community-based victims organizations, ensuring timely and effective access to specialist services and treatment and support. The Commission's been a long-standing advocate for the establishment of a specialist psychological trauma service for victims and survivors to be available regionally. Indeed, a recent survey by the Commission revealed that 21 per cent, 21 per cent of the population in Northern Ireland stated their mental health had been affected by the experience of a conflict-related incident. We believe this dedicated service network offers a means of response to the unique and profound impact of the troubles on population mental health. As an important commitment within the Stormont House Agreement, the creation of the RTN will represent a significant and necessary rehabilitation measure that will hopefully improve the psychological well-being of many victims and their families across this region in the years to come. A further achievement, and Luke has touched on this this morning as well, it came into being actually one year ago today, the Troubles Permanent Disability Payment Scheme. The establishment of the new scheme for victims and survivors represents an important achievement onto the strategy and significant acknowledgement for the considerable impact on the physical and psychological well-being of many severely injured uh, victims and survivors during the Troubles. It's important, I think, that we should recognise the courageous and tireless campaign led by mem members of the We Have Injured group throughout their many years lobbying government to make the scheme a reality. It's also then important to acknowledge the work of the colleagues in Victims and Survivor Services, officials within the Department of Justice, the Executive Office, the Northern Ireland Office, the Victims Payment Board itself, led by the President, Justice McAlinden, in administering the scheme. Last but by no means least, let's also consider the role of community-based welfare advice officers who've been instrumental in supporting victims and survivors submitting applications to the scheme. Now, according to the latest figures, the Victims Payment Board has had over 2,600 applications, 2,600, and to date, we've seen 35 awards made. We can only hope those numbers change, the balance changes. In the months ahead, it's important that the work continues at pace to ensure more applicants from Northern Ireland and beyond receive their award to enhance their financial well-being, particularly 
in these economic times. As Commissioner, I welcome the scheme's implementation, but we're also mindful that many bereaved victims and survivors are not eligible under the current regulations. We have the situation that widows and orphans who have developed lifelong trauma-related mental health conditions directly linked to the violent loss of their spouse or loved one are not eligible. We would hope that these inequities in the current regulations can be addressed in the future so bereaved individuals who were not present at the scene or the immediate aftermath of the scene can be acknowledged and supported by the scheme. Finally, on some of those successes, it would be remiss of me not to mention the time, energy and dedication of the Victims and Survivors Forum. Uh, its key delivery partner uh, was, part of, uh, was a key element of part of the last victim strategy and they're a key partner of mine. The forum, the forum, as many of you know, are a group of volunteers who come from different political backgrounds, different locations, different experiences of the troubles, but who are united in one shared belief that we must all do what we can to ensure we do not return to the dark, violent days of our past. The Forum have been monumental in providing their views and guidance on a range of issues, not least uh, those I've mentioned of some of the overall successes of the strategy. We must all recognise what an ask it is of them to use experiences of the most difficult and traumatic times in their lives to help shape policy decisions for the better. I, for one, have personally been in awe of the grace and the dignity with which they carry out their work. Now, over the years, the natural drop-off from political discourse and membership of the forum has been depleted. And as I mentioned, the absence of a commissioner has not helped. Uh, and I say this not to diminish the work, but rather, in fact, to show that they've redoubled their efforts of the remaining members and to recognise that the replenishment of the forum must be a priority for me in the months ahead. Uh, we must ensure that we have a representation of all the victims' experiences. So some significant achievements. Let's just reflect a little bit on the challenges. Over the summer months, we've had a depressing display of what Stephen Farry called casual sectarianism. Some of it may have been casual with little or no thought or consequence of the impact on, on victims and survivors. But not all of it was. Victims are being used for political gain and for feeding that sectarian divide. I've met many people in the Protestant Loyalist Unionist community who have expressed to me this feeling of losing. And recently I had an interesting meeting with a group that went through what they saw as victories for the other side, even providing truth and justice, even providing truth and justice for survivors, we seem to be fueling the them and us division. As a society, we clearly still haven't recognized and acknowledged fully our past. The pain we inflicted on each other, the suffering that victims and survivors continue to go through today, and the fact that by genuinely solving the acknowledgement and reconciliation challenges, without doing that, we'll never be able to fully embrace the future and create that vibrant, peaceful society that we wish for for our children and our grandchildren. I met somebody a few weeks ago who was in the maze long cash for four years in the, at the end of the, the 1970s. And he told me how prisoners from different compounds exchanged and shared views. They got an old tennis ball with a split in it. When you squeeze the split, you can see the empty inside of the tennis ball. Inside the tennis ball, they shoved notes, individual notes, sometimes complete essays, and they threw the tennis ball over the compound, over the wire into another compound. Using this system, prisoners shared views and exchanged information across the two prison communities. One of the last tennis balls thrown over before this gentleman's release had the most prophetic effect on him, and it was also one of the shortest notes ever exchanged. It simply said, is this as good as it gets? He thrown over the fence, he opened it up, and the note said, is this as good as it gets? The gentleman decided the answer was no. Things can get better. And I think it's why we're all here today. We share his views, but we also understand the challenges and the pitfalls. I believe as a civilized society, if we look at things through the eyes of victims and survivors and hold them front and center in everything we do, then we can work through the challenges. 
It can be too easy to forget about the individuals, the families, the communities that continue to live under this constant shadow of the troubles. And it certainly feels that victims and survivors have been forgotten if we consider the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Bill, to give it its full title. Shortly after taking up post of commission, in fact, two days into my job, the bill was introduced, the legacy bill, we'll call it, was introduced by the UK government. The introduction now of a piece of legislation to address our troubled past over seven years after signing the Stormed House Agreement should be, of course, welcome. But even I, two days into the job as a complete amateur, uh, reviewing the bill and listening to the feedback from victims and survivors in those first 48 hours, it was quite clear that the bill's primary intention left many in Northern Ireland feeling completely dismayed, hurt and angry by the UK government's approach. The Commission does believe that the legacy bill is fundamentally flawed and it's not victim and survivor centric. We certainly note the incredible strength of opposition to the bill from across the local political parties, from the many legal experts, including principally the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commissioner, as well as the Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights. Most importantly, many victims and survivors, including members of the Victims and Survivors Forum, have voiced their serious concerns about the bill. The Commission has adopted the position that while we're totally dissatisfied with the draft leg legislation, we must seek to make it, even if only marginally, better. My principal aim is to promote the interests of victims and survivors, so registering protest is, in my view, not enough to fulfil this aim. So we have the second reading in the Lords in a couple of weeks' time in September, the committee stage after that, likely in October, and if it's successful, the bill will change the landscape for victims and survivors. Now, if I'm an optimist and believe everything Northern Ireland Office tell me about the bill, then it's going to provide information and answers. But how can you tell a victim that you're going to remove some of the few avenues that have worked, such as civil cases and inquests, and replace it with an unproven commission with a limited lifespan? As a commissioner, I've said it's a terrible bill and it should not become law. The Victims and Survivors Forum have all declared similar feelings and have expressed these directly to the previous Secretary of State and more recently to Lord Cain, who will take the bill through the Lords. But I'm nervous that no amount of lobbying will deliver a significant change to the bill. But I do believe we need to try. Watching from the sidelines and hoping the bill will fall is not a risk strategy I can support. Thanks to the input of the forum, we've crafted some potential amendments and will continue to try and influence some changes. Secretary of, the current Secretary of State has said they're open to changes. Lord Cain has said they're open to changes. Time will tell. I do expect there to be amends in the bill as it passes through the Lords, but I still do not think it will be enough. And the passage of the bill through, the, through Parliament highlights another key challenge, and it was one that was highlighted to me by Lord Stoker in a conversation when I'd recently taken up the role. Not many people care about here anymore. Not many people care. We know it's a few backbenchers with an agenda far removed from Northern Ireland that have championed and pushed this bill. We know the Conservatives have a majority in the Commons. Um, we don't know what Boris is about to do to potentially strengthen his position or the Conservatives' position in the Lords in the days ahead. But I'm concerned that there will only be a small number of Lords debating the bill. And across both houses, many would be content to draw a line under the conflict and troubles without understanding or caring about the consequences of not addressing many of the legacy issues. As the bill continues its passage through the Lords in the days and weeks ahead, we'll seek to encourage peers to reflect on the serious limitations of the legislation and hopefully try and encourage significant amends. There are clearly requirements for clarification and strengthening of the investigative powers of this new independent commission for reconciliation and information recovery. I'm only getting my head around even saying ICRIR, but unfortunately I think we'll have to say quite a lot in the months ahead. 
While the Commission for Victims and Survivors is dismayed by the bill, it's referenced that no criminal investigation of any troubles-related offence may be continued or begun. It's imperative that future regulations provide the required reassurance that the ICRIR will have full policing powers to conduct ECHR compliant investigations at a time when current legacy mechanisms, including inquests, police ombudsman, legacy investigations, and the, the work of Operation Canova have been yielding substantial new information for victims and survivors. And in the absence then of, a formally, of the formally proposed historical investigations unit, it's incumbent upon the government to ensure the ICR IR leads a truth recovery process that has teeth. Or indeed, why not leave some of the proven avenues, such as inquests, in place, in parallel to the ICR IR? I also believe we must consider the voice of victims as part of this. Nowhere did I see victims' impact statements mentioned, and we would be encouraging it, the critical nature of getting the voice of victims and survivors heard above the perpetrator in the work of the ICR IR. Now, while the bill continues through Parliament, we'll have, we obviously have many other challenges to consider, and locally not least of which is paramilitarism. In concluding their report at the end of last year, the Independent Reporting Commission explic explicitly and unequivocally stated that paramilitarism remains a clear and present danger. My reading of this authoritative analysis is that lives, the lives of many individuals, families, communities, or indeed wider society in Northern Ireland continue to be threatened with murder, with injury, intimidation, exploitation on a daily basis because of the curse of paramilitarism. Young people can easily fall under the control of these groups through coercion or the offer of this sense of identity based on a romanticized past that never existed. Our education system, families and communities must be supported to provide a true understanding of our past and the impacts it continues to have. Paramilitary groups claim to provide community protection but they've also been responsible for 150 murders and subject thousands of individuals, including children and young people, to brutal life-changing attacks since 1998. As Commissioner for Victims and Survivors, the continued existence of both loyalist and Republican paramilitary groups is of utmost concern. I've had the privilege of meeting many individuals and families whose lives have been devastated by their traumatic experience of the Troubles and yet they can look forward. I'm aware many, many members of the Victims and Survivors Forum, past and present, while holding alternate views of the past, are unanimous that the past may never happen again, and they can sit around the table and discuss this. Yet both loyalist and Republican paramilitary groups, despite their culpability for causing so much misery and pain to victims and their families throughout the Troubles, continue to cause devastation and brutality to many in Northern Ireland. As a civilized society transitioning away from conflict and division, we must ensure that the violence of the past is not repeated, and we must work out ways to end the harm of paramilitarism for good. Regrettably, I think we've still a long way to go to ensure this is reality. Quickly and finally, let me turn to opportunities. There's a new victim's survivor strategy, imminent, provides an important opportunity for renewed focus on addressing the needs of victims and survivors here and outside Northern Ireland, uh, if we consider the limited uh, su support that's been provided by the Peace Programme. In a recent population survey commissioned by, the, by ourselves, the survey said 83% of the Northern Ireland population agreed that victims and survivors of the troubles, the conflict, living in Great Britain should be able to access the same services and support as those living in Northern Ireland. And 69% of the Northern Ireland population agreed that this should be the case for victims and survivors in the Republic of Ireland. Recent research and engagement work with victims and survivors located in GB and ROI highlight feelings amongst individuals and families that the state has let them down, reaffirming a sense of inequity and in access to services and support, and a general view that there's a lack of acknowledgement 
of their loss and injury experienced during the troubles and the conflict. In a recent paper submitted to TEO to help inform the development of the new strategy for victims and survivors, the Commission recommended the development of separate strategic action plans for both the UK and the Irish governments to address these issues, and I look forward to discussing that with them. An important focus within the new strategy will be delivering work that continues to build a better future for victims and survivors. Uh, while there will be a renewed emphasis on identifying and addressing the changing needs of victims and their families in Northern Ireland and elsewhere, there will be a concerted effort to mitigate the impact of conflict legacy issues negatively affecting our communities and wider society. In the context of reparations, we must endeavour to promote measures that support restitution and rehabilitation. And it will be equally incumbent upon the state at every level and civil society to addressing persistent factors that maintain division and sectarian prejudice and promote violence. Through the new strategy, there is a, an opportunity for the voice and agency of victims and survivors across these islands to be acknowledged and heard and their lived experience providing a powerful reminder to us all not to repeat the mistakes of the past in building for a better future for us all. I'm still not clear what the lack of an assembly will mean for the final development and implementation of the strategy, but we cannot make it an excuse for any further delay. Within my own control, and again, in the absence of leadership in the executive, I am developing a work plan that will focus on simple three broad areas. The first, not surprisingly, is advocacy for victims and survivors and ensuring they're in the middle of public policy thinking. That includes, as I've said, refreshing and enhancing the Victims Forum, Victims and Survivors Forum, which I hope will start in the, in the coming weeks. The second area I want the Commission to focus on is education and history. This follows my simple belief that if we all understand each other's past, then collectively we can look to the future and not make the same mistakes. The third and final area that we need to develop is the support for our children and young people who continue to live under the shadow of the conflict and the troubles. In closing, the key thought I want to leave you with is the continual need to ensure victims' issues remain high profile and that regardless of the drive to forget about the past or move on or draw a line under things, we actually stiffen our resolve to find solutions for the past so we can look to the future. Thanks again for this opportunity to speak and offer me a timely opportunity to reflect on some of the achievements, the challenges and the opportunities in front of us. And particularly wish you every success for today and the ongoing work that Luke and the team have been doing. Thank you. Moving smoothly, so I've managed to keep the time. Um, we'll now start with our first panel on victims and victimhood. So I'll call up our speakers. Um, got a couple, one, one person still to arrive yet, but um, if the rest of you want to come up. So we'll have time until about 11.30. So we'll also have time for the presentations and also some questions. So again, if there's any questions online, um, add them into the chat um, and I can uh, flag them up. And I'll hand over to Kieran, who's going to chair this session now. So which speaker is yet to come? Just run it in the order there. Yep. So, uh, hi folks, I'm Kieran McAvoy. Um, I work in uh, the law school here at Queen's and in the Mitchell Institute, and I'm chairing this session. Uh, as Luke said, one of our speakers is running late, so I think we'll, um, we'll just do this in the order that it's in. Is that okay, folks? Yeah? Um, so I think our first speaker then is Eva Williams. Uh, Eva is a postdoc um, working in the area of re uh, reparations. Um, she has significant experience across three um, sites. Um, I've been looking at her CV this morning, and uh, it's pretty impressive, so I'm looking forward to hearing from you. So Luke says 10 to 12 minutes each, folks, is that okay? So when we get to 12, I'll start like ringing a wee bell or something, so Eva, over to you. Thank you. All right. Um, 
Can I move the PowerPoint with this, I guess, or? I guess so, yeah. All right. I'm up next, so I'll Excellent. be, I'll be yeah. watching how you get on. <laughs> yeah. and see how it works. Shouldn't be too difficult. Yeah. Um, good morning, everyone, um, and thanks for the invitation to be here. It's great to be back in Belfast. Um, Today I will share some insights of an ongoing project on the role of uh, survivors in reparation politics in which I'm involved and um, for today I will look at the case of Guatemala uh, and more specifically I'm interested in how organized survivor groups act as drivers of transitional justice processes um, as well as in understanding uh, the motivations behind their reparation claims. Um, the insights from the Guatemalan case that I will present today are part of a two case study paper, which also includes the case of uh, Morocco and which is currently under review. Um, I will not present uh, the part on Morocco because the research has been conducted by my colleague, Pia Falschepner, um, but so I will stick to the case of Guatemala also for the sake of time. Um, so this research is part of a larger comparative project uh, that I'm collaborating on with uh, Pia Falschepner, Thorsten Bonacke and uh, so myself uh, at the Center for Conflict Studies at the University of Marburg. It's funded by the German Research Foundation. Um, and in the project we look at the role of victim groups in pushing governments to implement reparation policies uh, in the context of transitional justice processes and we look at four case studies so apart from uh, Guatemala and Morocco we're also looking at Northern Ireland and uh, East Timor. The fieldwork, uh, it's, it's a largely fieldwork based project which, which has been quite challenging because we started in 2020, so uh, not the ideal conditions uh, for traveling and conducting fieldwork, but we were able to collect data here in Northern Ireland uh, end of last year. Um, Pia has just uh, started her fieldwork in Morocco this spring. Um, for the case of Guatemala and Timor-Leste, we have not been able to conduct on-site interviews yet, um, mainly because of COVID, but also uh, because of my pregnancy. Um, so this is why the, today's findings on Guatemala are mostly based on archival sources uh, and document analysis. Um, but I think this is also the, the positive side of COVID that it has forced us to be creative and look for other um, very interesting uh, sources. So in the project we focus on reparation uh, politics because they are often among victims' first demands in the context of TJ. Uh, and therefore also an incentive for uh, victim sustained mobilization. Um, in the project we focus on the material aspect of uh, reparations and uh, also on administrative programs installed by governments. Uh, and this is of course without denying uh, the importance of other uh, dimensions and uh, measures of reparation. So in the paper, we start from the observation that victims' role in TJ processes tends to be primarily perceived as limited to that of beneficiaries of, or in the best case, participants in um, already made TJ programs and processes, while in fact, they are often um, one of the driving forces, if not the driving force behind politics of justice, truth, and reparation in the aftermath of uh, gross human rights violations. Um, also, if we track the history of these processes, we see that the existence of organized um, victim and survivor groups often predates an official TJ process. Um, so the two points that I would like to highlight today are the following. So firstly, um, using the case of Guatemala, I will show how in the wake of uh, human rights violations, survivors do organize as collective actors, uh, political actors uh, and drivers of TJ policies. Um, and secondly, I will argue that uh, the reparation claims that survivors make in the context of TJ are often linked to broader structural goals and visions of political and societal uh, change in the case of Guatemala with an emphasis on uh, socioeconomic inequalities. Um, so very briefly, some state of the art. So if we look at the debates um, around victims, in transitional justice, we see that there has been a growing interest, um, especially in the topic of victim participation. Um, however, with some important exceptions, this has hardly translated uh, to a deeper engagement with the role of victims as collective uh, civil society actors. And um, as important um, exceptions, I want to highlight um, the recent dissertations of Paul Gallagher, 
um, who has worked uh, especially on this, uh, on this topic, on the, the crossing of social movement theory and transitional justice, but also the work of Nissan uh, Alice, who is present here today as well, I can see. Um, so two um, Belfast-based scholars who have uh, worked on this very topic. Uh, but in general, still a lack of knowledge. Um, and as a result of this, the ways in which uh, victim organizations engage in contentious politics during DJ processes, the repertoires of actions they use, and also their impact on um, transitional justice policies remains rather uh, under research. Um, so as a consequence, we also still know relatively little about the different roles and meanings that these reparation claims um, take on for collectively organized victims. Now let me uh, briefly turn to the case of Guatemala. Um, if we have a closer look at uh, the history of the TJ process in Guatemala, it immediately becomes clear that victims can be an important driving force of TJ more broadly, and in this case also reparation politics uh, specifically. So uh, when the internal armed conflict was ended by the peace agreements in 1996, Guatemala witnessed what uh, Rodi Brad has called a resurrection of civil society in which victim groups who organized in national networks took up a leading role. And this is quite remarkable, especially given um, the decades-long uh, suppression of civil society during the successive um, military dictatorships. Then after um, the UN-sponsored Street Commission, the Comisión de Esclarecimiento Histórico completed its work in 99. Uh, it was a broad coalition of victim groups and civil society organizations that united in the so-called uh, Instancia Multiinstitucional para la Paz y la Concordia, um, who started following up on the recommendations of the final report of the Truth Commission and actively lobbying the government for the implementation of uh, reparations. And it was really these civil society efforts that eventually led to the establishment of the um, National Reparation Program in 2003. Now, what um, draws the attention in the case of Guatemala is that victim groups' demands uh, for reparations were uh, from the beginning formulated primarily within a discourse of violations of socioeconomic rights linked to historical structures of oppression and discrimination. And um, if we look at an example, for example, uh, of the CONAVIGUA, which is a national network of widows uh, of the internal armed conflict, um, if we look at their uh, foundational documents, which date from uh, 1988, so predates uh, the transitional justice process. Um, they state, um, and I translate here from uh, Spanish, that uh, the Conavigua is born from the pain and suffering that unites us after years of great injustice and marginalization, and so that our voice can be heard and we can exercise our legitimate rights. Um, and interestingly, as a collective of widows, they also frame this history of oppression as a result of the intersection of uh, race, class, and gender. So um, again, here they state, the people of Guatemala have lived through thousands, uh, hundreds of years of injustice, exploitation, discrimination, marginalization, and repression. But we women suffer twice as much, and indigenous women and widows suffer even more. Um, so their foundation is really grounded in this discourse of um, historical oppression. Um, so while the first demands of victim organizations like the Conavigua centered around the fulfillment of victims' basic um, needs, they also state that they want to seek structural solutions for ongoing injustices. Um, and I quote again, uh, we seek a root solution for the problem of the widows and women of Guatemala, but we will always um, begin with fighting to solve widows' smallest needs, um, but little by little we will make them grow from the small issues uh, to the big ones. So what we clearly see here is that reparation politics uh, for human rights violations that occurred during the internal armed conflict really served as a catalyst for um, victims to formulate grievances re related to historical um, processes of oppress oppression. Um, so in some demands that were both transitional and transformative in nature were taking, uh, taken to the negotiation tables when it came to uh, demanding reparations. 
Um, so very briefly to um, conclude, what uh, can we learn uh, from the case of Guatemala, but also um, in, in similarity with the other cases that we are studying? Um, we see that victim organizations in this case uh, indeed play a crucial role in shaping the DJ process. And in the case of Guatemala, they really acted as uh, strategic collective political actors and drivers rather than just uh, passive recipients of uh, TJ policies. And in particular, reparations, as one of the topics victims were most concerned with, served as an important field of action for collective claim making, mobilization, and empowerment of uh, victims. Um, so, depending on survivors' priorities and the particularities of a given TJ process, Demands for reparations take on different roles um, and meanings that also give us insight into the wider demands um, underpinning these uh, reparation agendas. And uh, again, in Guatemala, for example, we see that the emphasis was on socioeconomic justice. Uh, in the case of Morocco, um, which we also deal with in the paper, um, we see that political change and democrat democratization is higher up on a victim's agenda, uh, for example. Um, I think I will leave it at this. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. Perfect timing, actually. It's okay, very great. Uh, then, I'll, <laughs> then I'll leave it at this. Um, I'm looking forward to your uh, comments and questions in the discussion. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much, Thank you. <laughs> You've set a high standard in terms of uh, discipline and timekeeping, don't know, so uh, just saying that to our other colleagues here. Uh, our second speaker is James Gallen. James is an associate professor in Dublin City University. Um, his research interests include human rights, international law, legal and transitional justice. He was one of our, our team. Um, his, his book is coming out soon on transitional justice and, the historical, abu and historical abuse, church and state. Um, I read it and it's a brilliant piece of work actually. So i um, looking forward to hearing James. Your checks in the post for that <laughs> comment. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Kieran. Thanks to Luke and all the team at Queen's for the invitation to participate today. It's been a really great privilege and experience to be part of the project team. A lot of existing debates, as Luke mentioned, focus on the eligibility of victims for reparation schemes and the struggles to, uh, for, of victims and survivors to be included in particular schemes to include, for instance, victims of sexual violence or socioeconomic rights um, violations. However, it's clear that uh, having established a scheme, eligible victims might also experience distinct forms of harm in both that experience of advocacy and in the process uh, of applying or engaging with reparations themselves. One of the stated goals in the literature of reparations is to provide a function of officially acknowledging wrongdoing. In providing that acknowledgement, reparations might seek to affirm the status of victims as a right holder uh, or that the state had an obligation to prevent the harm or to remedy the harm at present. But my concern is that this obligation and this form of acknowledgement might occur at quite an abstract, formal and civic level, rather than also at the level of a individual belief, recognition and validation of victims and survivors. So if reparations operate only at this uh, civic level, it's foreseeable that they're going to be limited in their ability to make an effective contribution to any claimed healing or therapeutic benefit to survivors. And so the, fake, the focus of my uh, comments today is on whether and how survivors are believed uh, in the design and the administration of reparations. And in particular, can reparations serve or hinder uh, a concept of epistemic justice, justice relating to uh, forms of knowledge. So providing reparations might enable survivors to express their experience of harm, how it's affected their lives, and how that lived, have that lived experience officially believed and acknowledged vindicating survivors' truth about what has happened to them. However, there may also be a failure of acknowledgement and recognition and a lack of engagement with the voices and preferences of victim survivors, even though they might be eligible and receive reparation. So um, Luke, in his introduction, uh, and Eva, in her presentation, outlined some of the topology of reparations. We can distinguish between judicial and administrative reparations, uh, those that have a paper-only application process, those that involve an oral hearing, um, we can distinguish between material, uh, financial reparations uh, and symbolic uh, or uh, um, uh, reparations uh, uh, and also those that are collective in nature. Naturally, we're not going to be able to get to all of those today, um, but I would just suggest that it's possible that there may be this lack of belief in any of those forms of, of reparation. 
Um, so in developing the concept of uh, epistemic injustice, uh, the work of Gayarty Spivak describes epistemic violence as when marginalized peoples are prevented from speaking about themselves or their own interests because others claim to know better about what those interests are. And this concept has been developed then by Miranda Fricker, who distinguishes between two forms of epistemic injustice, a testimonial injustice, where prejudice on the hearer's part causes them to give the speaker less credibility than they would otherwise have been given. Uh, in reparations literature, we would, may be familiar with a gendered and a racialized prejudice that may lead some categories of survivors to not be believed. But we can also think of instances where survivor testimony is deemed false uh, in the face of contrary documentary evidence from the state or from other organizations, to give two examples. In contrast, we can also think about hermeneutical injustice, where the overall social experience of members of a marginalized group is left inadequately conceptualized or ill understood, sometimes even by the group themselves, and so it's unable to be communicated uh, to responsible actors. And we're starting to see this literature permeate the discussion in reparations. So a recent paper considers uh, this concept of hermeneutical injustice uh, facing indigenous peoples as they seek to advocate before the Inter-American Court of uh, Human Rights. Um, my work in the book Kieran mentioned on historical institutional abuse considers this experience of epistemic injustice in the context of reparations. So in Canada, they had an, an industrial school settlement agreement, which had two processes, an individualized assessment and a paper-based common experience payment. Em empirical studies of that common experience payment show that one third of survivors felt, quote, they were not believed in their first paper application although 15% felt reparations were symbolically important as a form of acknowledgement, uh, many felt the redress process, an administrative paper-based process, was re-traumatizing and distressing and was associated with a rise in accidental deaths, suicides, and homicides. A more recent empirical study criticizes the process again uh, and emphasizes a quote from one uh, government official who, which stated, we received many application forms that would come covered in extra writing, and sometimes there would be pictures and we didn't know what to do with that extra information. And I think it really encapsulates and captures uh, the uh, irony and the tragedy of trying to provide a less traumatizing, more efficient form of redress through an administrative scheme that is somehow denying uh, survivors their capacity and their rights as, as bearers of knowledge and bearers of truth. Um, some of you may be aware we see similar problems in the Irish experience uh, in uh, uh, redress schemes in the Republic. Um, survivors reporting a lack of understanding of their individual circumstances and a failure by the uh, Residential Institutions Redress Board to understand and empathize with their past experiences. Mairead Enright and Sinead Ring frame this uh, criticism as a testimonial injustice using Fricker's framework. Victim survivors, they say, are prevented from acknowledgement as a giver of knowledge and as an informant. And they know this is particularly insidious where it relates to a survivor's understanding of their own childhood. They say victim survivors feel the injuries they suffered are not heard and recognized as wrongs. And so these forms of administrative, uh, sorry, epistemic injustice confirm that administering reparations through less complex means, administrative means especially, is no guarantee of avoiding distress to survivors. Instead, the limitations of the approaches uh, show the real risk of re-traumatization for survivors seeking um, reparations. We also see that in the data set that we've gathered in, in this project. Um, we see instances of good practice uh, in the first uh, instance, many uh, uh, instances where survivors are emphasizing uh, the need for testimony to be uh, understood as being credible. You can see the quote from a Columbia interview there. Um, the first step this uh, participant uh, uh, believed was necessary for reparations to serve the function of recognition was to recognize survivor testimony um, uh, as being credible. In other instances, lawyers uh, recognized uh, the need to center testimony uh, and to contextualize testimony for the challenges it would face uh, in judicial forms of, of reparation. So in Guatemala, one participant said, the testimony of the grandmothers was the fundamental basis for our entire legal strategy. The testimony of the mother grandmothers was transcendental. But nonetheless, they noted, as you can see in the quote here, the need to, uh, to frame that testimony uh, and to prepare grandmothers to have it scrutinized and challenged by a, a legal process that would be prejudicial uh, and would uh, be uh, seeking to uh, challenge the veracity uh, of what they were saying. 
So we also saw a number of instances uh, of uh, testimonial injustice, that, that lack of belief of survivors. Um, this particularly related uh, to questions uh, of the testimony of women uh, and the testimony re regarding um, sexual violence. So uh, in, in both Colombia and Nepal, we saw instances um, of the self-censoring uh, of survivors uh, where they would re uh, refuse or, or choose not to go forward uh, with testimony regarding sexual violence because they believed uh, uh, that they would not uh, be understood or this, this would bring further shame and so social stigma um, to them. So these experiences, I think, reflect a, a varied experience of distress, of harm and injustice engaging with reparations processes where survivors are challenged in their status as knowledge bearers. We also see instances of hermeneutical injustice, so that uh, where the concepts of rights and reparations are being limited by survivors, or where survivors are aware of the need to reflect upon the concepts that are being offered to them by states, NGOs, um, and elites. Um, so in Colombia, one participant stated, survivors took the view the state has already defined these concepts of reparations and so on that Luke mentioned with so many vernacularizations, that these have been defined legally and what they mean for them but that it was incumbent upon survivors to process and understand what these concepts mean so they can create a root and a deeper understanding of how these things um, should come about. And so there's an awareness among civil society and survivor groups about uh, this contest about knowledge and the contest about power that comes with it. Just to conclude, I was looking over the project documents in reflection for today, and one of the uh, ideas was to analyze how reparations could be more effective and I think assessing how survivor credibility is established and assessing the power dynamics that go to informing how survivors are constructed and how concepts of, and practices of reparations uh, uh, relate to survivor uh, credibility would aid reparations policy uh, uh, to serve as a site of epistemic justice rather than uh, injustice. Um, we've seen two instances with the, uh, in the project that I think are really uh, significant in this regard. The first is a consistent cross-jurisdictional emphasis on the need for survivor access to archives and information to support and corroborate their experiences uh, and, and validate their knowledge. And the second Luke mentioned in his introduction is the idea of self-repair uh, as a mechanism for uh, providing uh, in, and living with enduring injustices. Catherine McKinnon says uh, in terms about law that I think you can apply to the reparations uh, and epistemic injustice question quite clearly. She says at its best, law means reality. It means what you say happened, happened, and that your knowledge is valid. The Belfast guidelines that are being launched today speak of the need for the co-creation of reparations with victim survivors and with other responsible actors. And in the case of administrative reparations for decision makers to operate from a good faith assumption that victims' claims are true. I think both of these commitments reflect the need for epistemic justice as an element um, of reparation. Thank you very much for your time today and look forward to any questions you might have. Cheers. Thank you, James. I see our fourth speaker, Mark, has joined us. Mark, if you want to come up beside me here, um, uh, you're, you'll be on after this next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Peter Murda. Peter is an advocacy manager uh, with SEF, a victims advocacy group here in Northern Ireland. Uh, Peter has five years as a practitioner um, within that advocacy function in SEF in their search for truth, justice and acknowledgement. So over to you, Peter. Good morning. Uh, as Kieran pointed out, I'm a practitioner. I don't really come from an academic background. Uh, I work for SEF, uh, Victims Group of the Northern Ireland, who provide a holistic range of services to everyone, to all victim, innocent victims within Northern Ireland and including Great Britain and the Republic of Ireland, where we have staff. I have to apologize. I only a couple of minutes ago realized you were looking for a form, formal presentation on this. So I'll go through this as, as I can. So I work in the line of providing truth, acknowledgement, and justice for victims. Truth, it can be very difficult, difficult in obtaining information, where you get the information from, source material, government agencies. And to be honest, it can be subjective to the individuals and in the truth they are searching for. In relation to, it doesn't always sit well with justice because constantly we're told by the by legacy investigation branch, previously HET, that it could prejudice investigations and therefore families do not always get the truth and information they're searching for. Justice overall 
hasn't been delivered for victims of the troubles in Northern Ireland. It, uh, HET process, there was five successful prosecutions and it's probably the most difficult element of the, of the three. And then there is the side of the justice in relation to if someone is convicted of an offence, then they only re receive the maximum of a two year custodial sentence. And for some of the victims that we represent, they think that's inadequate. Acknowledgement is probably the most success successful of the three elements in testimonies and commemorations commemoration events and victims feeling that they're not forgotten and they are recognized. However, with it tends not to come accountability. Most of the victims know how their loved one was killed, they know why their loved one was killed, they know where and the circumstances and it happened. But what they really want to know is who actually was responsible for that act. The, we were set up uh, back in 2017 and at that stage the Stormont House Agreement was meant to be in place, which was meant to deliver truth and justice and acknowledgement. However, though we agreed with the four pillars, we did have certain reservations in relation to parts of it and the Stormont House Agreement never really came into being. Currently, as the Victims Commissioner spoke about early on, we have the legacy bill that is going through uh, Parliament at the moment and is due to go to the House of Lords on the 13th of September. We are opposed to the bill because we think it takes justice completely off the table. And for the victims we represent, you know, that is not just palatable. They find it abhorrent that that should be removed. The reality is, however, that with the numbers in the House of Commons and the Conservatives who are pushing it through, in order to protect veterans that was contained within their manifesto, that it is likely to go through. And yes, we do not want to be complicit in that. However, we feel we have to engage and lobby and try and make amendments to make it more palatable to those we represent. I'm going to touch on a subject that is difficult. As a group, SEF only represent innocent victims of the trouble. And in that, we say people who are victims through no fault of their own, be it that they are victims of paramilitary or terrorist attacks or criminal acts committed by members of the security forces. We're not suggesting that those perpetrators don't suffer and there were not some mitigating circumstances where they may have been involved, but the majority of victims do not join such organizations. You know, they rely on the rule of law to apply justice. We just feel that perpetrators shouldn't be given the same equality and standing as victims. The use of language is difficult, and especially uh, within the victim sector. We feel that the, the victims self represent that there is a sanitized approach that terminology such as terrorism and terrorist has been airbrushed out. We don't agree with the terminology in relation to, to combatants, but we know these are difficult issues and it's something we have to engage on. Our victims also see there has been a, a rewriting of history, and especially there's been a criminalization of members of the security forces for one minute, we're not saying that there were not wrongful acts committed by some members of the security forces, but they were the minority rather than the majority. The inquest system, as we spoke about earlier on, overall, the victims 
we represent victims of paramilitary and terrorist organizations. The inquest system does not deliver for them. The majority of them, they had their inquests, which were sort of two to three hours in a court many years ago, very soon after the actual incident is, itself. They had no access to legal aid, and therefore they feel that it's something that has not been delivered on for them. We have difficulties in relation to legal aid and any funding for civil actions. There's no sort of cent central funding that provides victims with any redress civilly. Everything you are at relying on the goodwill of legal professionals, you know, to, to move cases forward. Uh, reparations, as we've touched on, uh, the bereaved, as the Victims Commissioner high, highlighted earlier, there's no one been more psychologically damaged than bereaved. And in relation to repara reparations, we feel that's something that has to be done about that. The bereaved have to be included, and it's something we will be advocating on behalf. Thank you. Here, here. Thank you very much. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Our final uh, speaker in this session is Mark Kelly, MBE. Mark is a, a, a WAVE citizen educator. He sits on their board and he was a member of the WAVE injured group, which successfully uh, campaigned for the pension for seriously injured people. And he was formerly the chair of a statutory committee on the employment of disabled people. Mark, thank you very much for joining us. Indeed, thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to suggest an adjournment because we're having a beautiful uh, <laughs> August and we don't get enough vitamin D3 in this country. <laughs> And it might be more appropriate to have this session in the evening. I hardly think that's going to happen, but uh, it was nice to think of it. <laughs> I haven't any sun factor on, and I'm getting magnified under it. I'm of my own <laughs> earthly spotlight. Uh, I, I could theorize, but you're going to get enough of that today. My input in this session is about a real lived experience. And the impact of conflict and the role that reparation played as a course of, of the time from when I was caught in a warning bomb explosion at 18 years of age. I should have been elsewhere. I should have been at the flat in Mungrana, but circumstances transpired and it was part of fighting the social injustice and I think that's inherent in my nature if there's something wrong i will seek to challenge it but unfortunately that has been my experience all too often i've had to fight battles that were unnecessary they were uh, wholly demoralizing they were uh, un as i say unnecessary when you go to statutory providers post your conflict-related trauma. And I say that clearly because it was as a result of a societal breakdown and failure to reach agreement that conflict breaks out. And therefore, the need for reparation subsequent to that has to be looked at. And the delivery of those reparations ha has to be done, as some of the speakers have indicated, with the appropriate degree of empathy now, we know there are a few chanters in Northern Ireland. You, you know, that's the nature of the game, and there are more blue badges out there than I, I would care to see, but, and, and, and I understand invisible disability. Yes, I do. I, I, I give way to that. But um, DLA used to be one of those other ones, the back, the proverbial back issue. So I, I'm just conscious that, yes, it has to be a fair system, there has to be a system that, that has a duty of care to all. But I, uh, I, I suppose the nature of things is that, yes, society has many more uh, breakups of marriages than it would have had and breakdowns of relationships than it would have had previously. But this uh, is something that's more prevalent even with those who have been trauma affected. And um, that can leave you on a nomadic phase, particularly if you're the male. You, you, you know, there's greater protection. And 
for the children. They're, they're the core uh, concern at this point in time. But to cite an example to you, and this is all very personal, and, and my children still live in this country, thankfully. Um, but what money was tied up in the marital home was being held by solicitors until a final agreement could be arranged. I put a large part of the compensation I received into that. Now, this is the compensation that was found to be wholly inadequate and, and therefore the judgment and the payment board that that has arisen and come about, you know, when people were living on benefits, uh, that, that was evidenced through a study. So that uh, meant the monies were tied up and I, I tried living with my parents, I tried living with my brothers, everything at slopes and uh, no appropriate disabled adaptations as the marital home had. So um, I, I, my daughter came to me and said, Dad, I can no longer live with, with mum at, at home. I have one A level to repeat that she had taken early and, and have others to do, and I need to focus on these uh, going forward. Is there any chance you can get a house? So I approached the public housing, and uh, the housing executive brought me uh, Forensics determined it was a no warning. The bomb that I was caught up in was typical of Mount Vernon UVF. And uh, therefore, that's, that's appropriate when I mention that because the house they suggested was in Old Mosley, not New Mosley, in Glen Gormley. And, and it was deemed uh, not as, not as uh, risque for a Catholic to go into that area. And my guys are coming in with Fort William school uniforms you, uh, when they were staying with me every second weekend. But my daughter begged, and the house they offered me had 11 steps from the road to the front door of the house, to the front gate, and then you had two steps up into the house. Now, it did have a downstairs shower, but the bedroom was upstairs. So I, I said, I'm desperate, and I think you're playing in this, and, and, and uh, this can only be short term. So I, I was looking at applying for, for the purchase of the property I'm currently in, the, the Housing Association property, and it was over five years that I was in that property, and I had a recurrent abscess at the time, which needed to be uh, excised via surgery, that would have necessitated me going to the wheelchair. And uh, that, that would have uh, meant I couldn't access the house unless somebody was going to pull me up, pull me down, and do whatever else. Now, my kids were coming to me every second weekend. That extended to throughout the week, and, and eventually they came to live with me on that property. At 10 o'clock at night, we had to turn the beds of tea in the living room into their room. I couldn't get into the kitchen. My, I was limited in movement throughout the house. Uh, I mentioned the estate. Um, yeah, it wasn't as bad, but there were still two fighting factions of loyalism within that estate. When the van came in, they, seemed, they, they were on the other side of the steps, and they gave me a loud encore, you know, just to make sure. That, that I didn't miss out. I was going to come out with a guitar and ask, you need another band member, but probably that wouldn't have gone down too well. So um, that's another thing that gets us through dark humour. But, but um, when they're leaving fake petrol bombs at your doorstep and scraping your car and saying things to your daughters and son, you become a little concerned. I learned one thing through the divorce was to get everything stamped your copy, their copy, get them to acknowledge it, and I took that out. And it was during my exhausted phase and not wanting to give in to threat that I uh, had a conversation with Housing Rights, and you'll talk about the role of organisations in the afternoon, but Housing Rights took the load and shared the load with me, and a precedent was set, and not just based on disability, but fathers who were separated to have appropriate rooms to accommodate their family when they came to visit so that relationship wouldn't break down. And 
if I could say very quickly, that to me, and we don't do hierarchy in, in, in the victim's family, but you know, the loss of a family member, death, it is irreversible. And that is uh, how I felt during this process, somewhat akin to a bereavement, in that I, I couldn't do anything to sort the needs of my family, and I'm a very protective parent. I mean, believe you me, I washed enough uh, white shirt uniforms in the fake tanner. Uh, the, yeah, I, I was even stupid when they asked me to put the fake tan on. I even volunteered the <laughs> services for that. So um, that, that a precedent was set, and therefore seeking help helped me on that journey to, to get moved on and get to appropriate accommodation for both myself and my family. And that made life so much better. But reparation takes many, many forms. If your prosthetics aren't fitting, I'm here today not wearing prosthetics. I'm a 24-7 user of the prosthetics, but they have to fit. They're like a good pair of shoes. Lads, you'll know what I'm talking about, won't you? If the shoes aren't fitting, they're not good, you know? I don't want to say ladies, because I've been known for being sexist, but I have three daughters, so, you know, it, if, if it doesn't fit, all the technology through the Paralympics is on view, but if the shoe don't fit, it's no good. So I've had six months off this year, I've had six months off last year. There was the possibility of wrong casters having been fit to the wheelchair, so I, when I was going down to get the blister sorted on one side, I came flying out the other side and uh, fractured the femur. So I'm on the road back, but, but it's been particularly challenging to trying to get appropriate access to the service providers. But I had a leg which is considered, uh, was considered advantageous in that it had a long residual stump and an end bearing, which meant I could put weight through it and get a sense of what the artificial foot was doing. That leg, um, uh, it's, it's not so good now because they can only provide one microchip me. I was falling too often and fearful at my tender years now, the old man I just sat in, and that if I were to fall, break an arm, fra fracture an arm or something else, I'd be immobilized or, or impaired in some way going forward. So the electronic microchip knee had the advantage of it has anti-stumble in it and I wouldn't fall over. But the problem is to incorporate the electronics, they have to make it articulate sort of above the calf, not, not where it should do at knee. And when you're trying to get into cars, they have to make you taller to accommodate this. So you further to pick, pick up stuff. If you do fall, you further to fall. If you're getting into cars or plane seats, it's sticking away out in front of you. It looks pig ignorant. My, my granddaughter reacted badly to it uh, initially and all of this. So there is an option available and it was akin to the mechanical model I had earlier. And it was a, they call it a polycentric knee. So it's many centers. It's available, it's available for less than, if you, if you go privately, you can get it less than the, the sea leg that I've got. Maybe they've got a deal on sea legs, but I can't get this under the National Health Service. I think it's particularly wrong to ask people post-conflict and who have experienced uh, uh, real trauma to, to, to ask to pay for their services, so much so that um, when I, I asked the doctor for a script for pseudocreme, she says, you can get that in the chemist. He says, I'm not paying for the privilege of having my legs blown off. If that gives you some sense of where we're coming from, you, you know, it's, there's a societal duty in debt. And when I talk about, when I talk about the conflict-related um, trauma, when we see our politicians failing to deliver, I don't want to become a WhatsApp grandfather because we can't provide a vibrant economy to make our young people want to stay home, raise a family, because we have some talent in this country. You know, yes, if they wish to go, if they wish to see the world well and good, that's their choice, but not because of our feelings as we try to transition. And that's all part of reparations for me, making us a better place to, in which to live, making it a better place.
for those who were deeply impacted by it. I could talk about the forms and the nature of the forms and why mine isn't submitted to date because they went from one to 100% with an evident physical disability and proof that they need to want you, you to bring it beyond 100%. So um, the Victims Payment Board, I haven't even submitted it then because the standard of the application that I saw made on my behalf was unacceptable. Uh, I, I, I looked at it, and the only reason I looked at it was I wanted to hold back instead of allowing the person assisting me to hit the play button. I didn't see it until after I then had something checked out about beneficiaries. That was another issue, and we fought long and hard for that. Now, I know they have to be appropriate. They have to be regard for law in case they're challenged and everything else. But by God, I don't need 2% of this. My transition started... 46 years ago, not from the Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. So John knows how long these battles have taken and, and more part of your elbow for having stuck to the marathon that was in front of you. So I'm going to leave conference with that. I could go on it and 46 years is a long, long time. There have been many ups and many downs and to be living is part of that reparation too. How we and manage to live is also important and reparations contribute to that and there's many forms and there are many forms sorry that's great thank you very much mike thank you <laughs> right folks i think we have about 15 minutes for comments and questions now luke do we have a room and mike uh, yeah so um so anyone in the audience uh, wants to kick us off i have a few questions but um i'll give you first bite I see Anna Bryson's hands up there. Thanks very much, Karen, um, and thanks to all the speakers um, uh, for some really, really insightful and interesting presentations. James, I had a question um, for you. Um, I was really struck by what you said about the, the limitations of many reparation schemes and the inability to capture the complexity of individual experience. And we heard so poignantly from yourself there about you know, just how complex an individual those needs can be. I was just thinking, I suppose, as you know, I have a particular interest in oral history and its role in transitional justice. And I wondered if you could say just a little bit more about how potentially oral history, oral testimony capture might operate in practice. You mentioned archives towards the end as one means of, of kind of addressing the issues. And I, I wondered if you could say just a little bit more about how perhaps oral history might help to inform the design and delivery of effective reparations programs. Thank you. Okay, can you just hold that one for, for, for now, James? I'm going to see if I can get one or two other, and we'll take them all at once then. Okay, I see Kevin Hardy's hands up there. I, uh, this is a, a question for Peter. It was very uh, interesting, your, your talk there, and you talked about sort of the, the three things that the, your group are interested in, uh, truth, justice, acknowledgement, and that acknowledgement was actually maybe the one that you've had most success with uh, so far. I'm wondering how do you measure that? So in terms of justice, justice is measured by a conviction through, through the criminal justice process. Truth is measured possibly by establishing that somebody was innocent or that certain claims made about them in the past was, was factually incorrect. How, how, do, how do your group and the victims you, and survivors you represent manage, manage acknowledgement? And is there uh, certain you know, forms of acknowledgement that are, are more successful or more palatable to, to uh, the group uh, and the victims and survivors you represent than, than others are. Thank you. Okay, can you hold that one, Peter, just on acknowledgement? Yeah. Uh, okay, I have a question, which I think is for all of the speakers, actually, because one of the things it, it came up, I think, as a theme right throughout. And as, 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 as different people were speaking, I was thinking about an experience I had about 10 years ago. I was doing field work in Sierra Leone, and uh, the in Sierra Leone, there's a lot of, uh, there's an amputee community, basically, the, the rebel group in particular, the RFU there, um, engaged in systemic amputations of people as part of extreme human rights violations. And so there are advocacy groups within um, the amputee community, like, and some people are double amputees, and some people have lost both arms, but it's, 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 it's a horrendous picture in some instances. But anyway, when I was in Sierra Leone, the president of the amputee community was involved in a very uh, public row with the president like and this man had he was a double amputee from uh, he'd lost both arms um, in, in trying to prevent his daughter from being raped 
and so he's, he's a very high profile character within the, the politics of, of victimhood in, in Sierra Leone. And I'm thinking, how does a politician pick a fight with a man like this, you know, politically? You just think, what politician would pick a fight like this, with this kind of a man, that kind of profile? And I asked that question to a few people when I was doing the interviews, and one of them kept saying, well, and then eventually I kind of got it and said, well, this, that man would be known publicly as being a very angry victim, an angry victim, okay? And so my question, I think, to all of the, the panelists when we take those is, what is the role of anger and moral outrage in victims' advocacy? How does, how does it, it, I think it links to what you were saying, Peter, I think it links to what you were saying, Jim, I think it links, it links to all of you, because sometimes if people's voices are too loud or too angry, then politicians and other stakeholders don't listen. They can turn it off, they turn the volume down, basically. So anyway, that's my question. I'm happy for all of you to address it. But we'll take the, the questions in, in the order they come in. So first, James, your, your answer to Anna on oral history. Thanks very much for the question, Anna. Yeah, I think there's a huge role, potentially, uh, for oral history to contribute to, to reparations. I think in the context of the work I've been doing, especially in Ireland, my deep concern would be around sequencing um, of that and also then the intended meaning uh, or the communicated meaning regarding the, the reparations. Um, so the literature that I mentioned in the paper often sets a very high set of expectations around reparations. Um, if they're going to have these administrative processes or they're going to be paper-based, um, or even if they're, they're going to be limited in their eligibility and their design and their um, munificence and so on, I think we have to understand them as, as palliative, um, as, uh, as necessarily inadequate. And I think in framing that inadequacy or in framing that uh, limitation, it's incumbent upon states and incumbent upon civil society to identify well, what are the sh how can we address those shortcomings. And if it is a case that one of the shortcomings is a lack of epistemic justice, I think oral history can play a really significant uh, role in, in meeting that need. Um, I guess my concern is in, in the Irish context, that's one of the government lines at present uh, regarding historical abuse, which is, um, we're sorry we screwed up your testimony at the investigation, but you can have an oral history project to tell us how you really feel, and it's a SOP, and it won't be set up for 10 years. Um, and I think that's a complete misuse of both the, the, the paradigm and the, and the, and the field. Um, so I think if it is to play a role, it has to be effectively sequenced with a reparations process that is trying to meet the more material uh, and practical uh, needs. Um, but it also has to, I think, um, be sequenced with survivor access to, to archives, because again, um, some of the advocates uh, and, uh, advocacy groups are identifying, well, I would give testimony or I have given testimony, but that would be different and that would be enhanced if I see what they said about me, if they say what, what is unknown about me uh, or about my family history and, 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 and so on. Um, so I think there is significant potential, but only in a coherent package of transitional justice, and that sounds lovely on paper, but you know, when I, if you could see one, you'll let, let me know. Thanks. Okay, Peter, on the question of acknowledgement. Yeah. Acknowledgement, no one victim is the same, do you know, and what works and what puts one victim in a better place might not necessarily work for another, and they all have different needs, as I'm sure we're all aware. I think one of the most successful things this year has been significant anniversary commemoration events, you know, in services, and that acknowledge, acknowledgement that their loved one isn't forgotten, you know, or what happened to them. Uh, publications on the back of them have been sort of very successful. And the families, you can see, it does put them in a better place. Media, some victims, get some benefit from media participation. Others don't and find, find it traumatic. Testimonies can be difficult because people have been encouraged to give their testimonies prior to them actually going, going through with it. But retrospectively, looking, at, looking back on it, the majority will be grateful they were given the opportunity and they took that opportunity. So, uh, Eva first and then Mark on this question, maybe about anger and moral outrage and how that uh, helps or impedes victim advocacy. So, Eva first on the Guatemalan experience. Yeah, very interesting question. I think uh, if we talk about victim activism and advocacy and mobilization, I think anger and moral outrage in many cases are one of the first drivers 
um, of this kind of uh, mobilization. Um, and especially if we look at, um, then in the case of Guatemala, the historical process and, and these longer processes of injustice, um, but also the re-traumatization throughout the whole process, which um, adds up to this anger, right? So mostly this anger only gets um, bigger throughout the process. Um, now, whether or not this angry victim or this moral outrage is accepted by public opinion or by uh, politicians that have to deal with these uh, claims made by civil society is another story, right? Because this depends a lot on what the expectations are um, on, on the behavior of victims or the, the stereotypes that victims mm -hmm. uh, should fulfill. And I think their anger uh, especially is, is not always accepted because victims are expected to uh, behave in a certain way and, and, and the sad victim is a lot more accepted than the angry victim. Um, I did my PhD on, on the case of Peru and there it was actually often said by um, public opinion in general like these victims are always angry like uh, as something that was annoying right like can you please stop being angry and turn this into something more mm -hmm. constructive maybe mm -hmm. li like as a so I think um, there's two sides to it. It is an important driver, but it's not always accepted. So Mark, what about the pensions camp? I should say that I, I've read, I, I was uh, one of Paul Gallagher, your colleague's uh, supervisors for his PhD. Yeah. I've read the 180,000 words <laughs> of the campaign uh, and, and all of the different stra clever we'll and amazing strategies you guys did. Uh, so, uh, but what about this issue about the, the angry victim and whether or not that, that politicians turn, turn the volume down? Where did that feature in your campaign, those kind of discussions? Firstly, the example you cited as a father, a man was witnessing his daughter being raped. That is trauma sufficient, you know. Uh, people have said to me, you're very magnanimous, Mark, and you hold no bitterness. If it was my child, it would be very different. Then to lose your arms on top of that, he's right to be angry. Um, how we use that anger is, is what's important. And as you say, it can be the motivational spark. It can be the Tom Cruise and the 4th of July or that film is, you know. We talked about chaining ourselves to Stormont. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of good that would have done because they weren't there half the time. <laughs> but um, that, that said, on a serious note, we um, took media training from Northern Visions Television, a community-based organization that uh, made that accessible to us because we knew whatever time we might get from media was precious. We couldn't come on and be the angry head because we had the moral argument. It, it was there. It, it, we also had ensured it was evidence with appropriate material. So it was a, a part of ensuring a strategy was devised and was adhered to. And the people could get sense of it. I didn't have to say, oh, I blisters on my bloody stumps. Mm -hmm. All I had to do was take the leg off mm -hmm. and they could see seeing sometimes mm -hmm. it says a lot more than words and indeed uh, we were fortunate to have as a member of our board a former director of communications for the Northern Ireland office and believe you me if you've got a skill set uh, within WAVE and I'm sure any other voluntary organization you'll utilize that as best you can so that, that was all part and parcel of it and having that confidence within the time allocated to you to not be the proverbial angry head, realised you had the moral argument on your side and it was for our politicians as we transition from conflict to find solutions. Okay, thank you, Mark. Peter, do you want to reflect on that in terms of the, your experience in SAF? Or? Certainly, uh, I think the biggest focus of anger I've seen is from victims who constantly throughout the last 30 years have had no delivery on truth and justice. And you can see it when they're engaging with the statutory bodies, that anger coming out. They're continually told mm -hmm. the same story, you know, but it doesn't take them anywhere. And they, to be honest, the older they get, almost that trauma comes through and the, and the anger comes through with it. Okay. James, did you want to pick up on, on that at all? Yeah, just one of the questions that drove me to look at the, the Irish stuff was why you know, why, why pick a fight, right? Why, yeah. why, why, when you meet someone distressed and, and, and traumatized and so on, do you not want to meet their needs if you're the state, right? And, and the only emotional response that I could think about when faced with anger, when faced with the awkward victim was, well, the state, 
either officials or, or a developed culture of contempt, mm -hmm. of going, oh, you're really making me do this? Mm -hmm. You're really making this awkward? Yeah. yeah. You're really yeah. making me yeah. sit with your pain and not mm -hmm. just do this as a bureaucratic yeah, exercise? Yeah. And I think that's the real risk, is anger is completely legitimate, but I think it has this, this um, expunging effect on, on the hearer or on the, or on the, on the state official. Um, and I think you know, it has to then be something that, that has a shelf life, but as you say, it has to be strategized mm -hmm. when, when and how it's used. Okay, thank you. Any other, Luke, is there any coming in online? Obviously I can't see, so um, if there's anything that you know, nothing in particular that's jumping out. Um, I think this session is coming to a natural close unless anybody wants to get in a last comment or question. Okay, um, the, this session is now finished. Um, could you just join me in expressing our appreciation?